Hello, I'm Ray Smith. Hopefully you've been watching my other videos uh, coordinated to my jazz pedagogy book and also my saxophone pedagogy book. Uh, the channel has different playlists that have got a lot of videos that are instructional. I wanted to add a video here uh, based on taming the beast. <laughs> In other words, conquering the soprano saxophone. Uh, the soprano is a different animal. It's uh, the most difficult of all the saxophones, especially from the standpoint of playing it in tune with a good sound. Uh, it's just not reasonable to say, I know the fingering so I can play the soprano. <laughs> Far from the truth. <clears throat> Knowing the fingers is, uh, fingerings is, is like ground zero. Now what do we do to get up to having a good sound, playing in tune, uh, and all that goes with it? So. Let me uh, illustrate a few things because this is a difficult instrument. I, I think that the biggest challenge, as I mentioned, is intonation. And I think it's common. I'm going to use a little classical tune here by Charles Gounod. This is how I usually hear the soprano played. Flabby in the low register, sharp in the high register. I want to try to give you a little bit of help with this. Uh, uh, if I play this way. Now instead of. You cannot let down in the low register. As soon as you cross over the break, breaks between C sharp and D, the minute you cross below the break, you've got to be putting the jaw into the reed and pulling up on it. As soon as I cross over the other side of the break, I've got to be blowing down. Hole steps are usually too wide. I mean, too narrow, and I've got to widen them. They're usually too narrow. I've got to widen them. Half steps the same. See, that's way too narrow. Why? Because I'm way flat. I've got to push up when I go below the break. So <clears throat> this is really a big problem. I, I actually want to let you hear just a touch of that piece. Uh, it's actually on my classical CD. One of the one of the CDs um, <clears throat> to be able to hear it myself. I got to use headphones because I'm going to have it come straight into your recording. Okay, now let's uh, let's actually go to this for a second, and you can hear this in its context. And it is definitely a challenge. This this tune is very difficult because everything is right over that break part and intonation is really difficult, even though the notes seem easy. I did with this in a, in a cathedral with a, an organ. And actually, let me skip this ahead to about where we were playing a minute ago. That's just a little bit further over. Okay, it comes right after this. We're in minor right now, and then we're gonna go to major for this. Uh...
That's probably enough of that. <clears throat> you get the, the feel for that. That's a very difficult thing to play in tune on the soprano. But uh, you can see that it can be done. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some uh, ideas about how to work on these things on the soprano. Now, obviously, this has got to start with just the basics of good tone production. And so I really recommend Chapter 8, The Basics of Tone Production, in my book, The Science and Art of Saxophone Teaching. And I also recommend uh, Chapter 16, which has a lot to do with solving problems with your tone. And these are there's a number of exercises there and so on. Chapter 10 deals with the warm-up exercises. And then there again in Chapter 16, um, you've got to be able to play your basic embouchure, breast support, oral cavity, have a reasonable setup. Those are the factors of, breath, of uh, tone production. You've got to deal with those things. That's the same on all saxophones. But you've got to deal with that on the soprano. You can't just assume because you did it on alto or tenor that you can do it on soprano. It's a different animal. You, you really must uh, pay your dues on each of the instruments. They're not just, be, you can't get it by just by knowing the fingerings. Uh, but I would go back and do those exercises, such as the... Uh, go up chromatically. You're not going to get as high on the soprano as you can on alto and tenor, or berry. The soprano uh, reaches a peak about that second octave. It's difficult to get a lot higher. Um, you can get a D, you can get the uh, the third above it. It's pretty hard to get the, the next note above that um, on the soprano. So don't kick yourself around too much if you're not getting uh, much higher than the second octave on the overtone series. But you do need to do those exercises on the soprano. You also need to do the flexibility exercises. These are also demonstrated in much greater depth in those other chapters that I've mentioned. But You're down about a fifth on the soprano, just like you can on the alto. The bigger instruments have a hard time going as far as, as that. You know, tenor or fourth is pretty good. Um, Barry, a third is going to be pretty good. But on the soprano, I can not actually go as much as I can on the alto, down about a fifth. And I do that on each of the palm key notes. Etc. Get that flexibility built up in your old cavity. Those things are uh, very important. Um, and then I would... I would do a five note exercise, and I would do this with a tuner. Watch the bottom note and the top note, and make sure you're getting the pitch on those. Etc. And I would keep going. I mean, until you're like. <laughs> go right to the top of that and check your pitch on the top and the bottom of those intervals and get those intervals lining up. I think that helps a lot on soprano. I would also suggest then see if we can bridge from the low register to the high register just by doing two octave. <laughs> On whatever notes you know but do go across two octaves you could put the third into if you want to but for the pitch i think that it really keeps the issue pretty clear if you've got those perfect intervals really helps to kind of bridge across the range of the instrument, see if you can get those to really uh, sit where you want them to sit. And you can do that also with a tuner. You could do it with a drone. Uh, I think working with a drone with that kind of stuff is excellent, as you can hear the relationship builds your ears too. Uh, <clears throat> so what are some of the very typical problems that we have on the soprano? 
when I'm working with students, almost always, well, the first problem I have is is the attitude that I've already mentioned, that I know the fingering, so I should be able to play this instrument. No, 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 it's not ever that simple. Uh, <clears throat> but the first, I gotta take the read up to take my mouthpiece off, but I wanna illustrate this. The first thing I always check is the mouthpiece pitch. This is just a barometer of where we should be on the soprano. And majority of the time, I'm hearing that pitch too high. This is, of course, true for all the saxophones, but it's particularly problematic on the soprano when I'm playing. Almost every student I've tested has been playing a D. When it needs to be a C. It's a good idea to play scales and chords on your mouthpiece. Uh, so I, you can see I can play over an octave on it. Where should I be playing when I play the saxophone then? I need to be playing on the soprano, a D. And a C, I'm so sorry. This is a soprano D, a concert C. And these are at a loud level. We test these at a forte level. This is gonna be way too high. You can play to about an E flat on the soprano mouthpiece. Too high. be somewhere closer to that so that changes my oral cavity and how my tongue positioning is working how the voicing is working in my oral cavity that's huge that will really help to get things coming together on the soprano i think another thing that always happens is the high notes on the soprano are going to be pretty sure this is true on all the instruments but it's kind of extreme on the on the soprano when you play a high b or a high c sharp it's really likely for that note to be very very sharp and so you pull out to kind of favor that. And your low register, your C sharp, especially in your B, have gone way flat. No. We've got to push in the mouthpiece until the low register is up to where it needs to be because you can only bite it up so much. We do need to test it with a firm embouchure, good focus. I want to go higher, and it's sharp, I've got to blow down. Flat, no, keep this focused. Sharp, no, blow down, but don't change the focus. That's a tongue positioning thing where I blow down. And again, I would work that with, with the uh, drones, work it with the tuner, work it with smart music. Terrific program for, for that. <laughs> then we can finally get this uh, to start lining up. Uh, <clears throat> I think another thing that I often face on the soprano is people drop in their jaw as they go low. <laughs> the tone has spread out a lot. Should be here. So it's consistent with the high register, but when you go, and the low registers are going flat, because I've dropped my jaw and I've loosened up, you can't do it on soprano. As I go below the break, like I say, as soon as I dip below D, jaw goes forward and f right into the reed more firmly. That'll keep everything up where it belongs in the low register. Uh, a couple of unique fingerings uh, on the soprano. On the other instruments, we can use what I call the long C sharp, which would be like a D minus two fingers, the top two fingers. So really what the finger then is thumb, three, four, five, six, or anything on the bottom hand. Contextually, it doesn't matter. Thumb three is the main fingering, and then four 
or four five or four five six or five or any combination of the bottom hand doesn't really matter based on where you're at in the context of of your line but this is a great fingering on alto tenor and berry but it does not work on the soprano you could hear it didn't work a minute ago It is not working. And so, unfortunately, we can't use that on soprano. However, I, I do leave the third finger down, not with the octave key and not with anything on the bottom hand, but leaving that third finger down as I go, go in lines across the break and so on will actually smooth things up a lot because it takes one of the variables out of the octave key linkage and can help quite a bit. I do that often to uh, to be able to uh, keep it smooth. Uh, leave that third finger down. Um, <clears throat> oh, another thing that, that if your C sharp's sharp uh, flat, you're focused up. Usually, I don't want to have to do anything to that. I want to be pushed in enough that when I'm firm and focused, the C sharp's right where it belongs. Now, I don't want that to be sharp because that just causes problems upstairs. But I can, if I need to, in a circumstance where I need that C sharp to be a little higher, I can use the side C. These things are actually in the book. And I think uh, there's another thing that you can do on soprano that you can't do on alto and tenor. <clears throat> if you tried to play a C to D trill, regular C to D in the middle there, over the break, on alto or tenor, we pretty much have to use the E flat key. Doesn't work that well on soprano, but the side E, the right, the high side key on the other side. That can work pretty nicely on this on the soprano. I wish that'd work on the other ones. It's a lot easier. Uh, but it does, that will not, that'll be way too wide on alto and tenor and bearing. It won't work, but it works on the soprano. So it's a good thing to know. Uh, your altissimo on the soprano is pretty much the same fingerings as alto. It'll work about the same. I have a high G on this instrument as a, as a key. Uh, you've got a split, we've got a split F sharp G key here, but I never use it much. I, I usually just finger the altissimo fingering that I would use, just like I'd use it on alto, or the high F sharp. Sorry, that's in a jazz context. I usually use the the uh, palm key F sharp in a classical context if I'm not going higher, but uh, uh, sometimes I'll use that front F sharp, and it'll work the same on soprano as it does on alto. So that works pretty well the same. Probably one of the really big challenges of soprano is that it doesn't... Well, it, it's like having a magnifying glass on all your faults. So everything that you do is magnified. And so if you do something one way on alto or tenor, for example, let's say your vibrato. So you got your vibrato working about the way that it would on alto or tenor. On the soprano, it's going to be too much. You got to narrow it. Uh, it's really common to hear soprano players play. have too much vibrato, too wide. No, the vibrato needs to be. Very contained, very narrow. I've actually, I'll give you a little thought on this, uh, something that I've done a lot of is where I'll just hold a note straight tone and then I'll see if I can just introduce this barely, almost imperceptible, barely perceptible, Shimmer. I don't even think vibrato. Very small. Really takes a very narrow vibrato to make that stuff work. So, uh, those are some of the common problems that I find on the soprano. Uh, I'm going to switch to my jazz mouthpiece to illustrate, to illustrate a couple of more things. 
By the way, if there's any way that you can get some experience playing in a classical quartet, that just really helps your soprano playing a ton. Playing with other people in any kind of context where you have to work with people and tune with people, very helpful. Always takes me a couple of times to get this read in a good place. I can't really see where it is. It's so clear. It's so leisure. All right, so I've got my jazz mouthpiece on now. In the jazz style, we have the same issue that everything is is magnified. Because if I scoop this way, same way I'm used to scooping on outdoor tenor, it ends up being more than I really want. I have to make it even smaller on soprano. Uh, the same thing is true of the vibrato. If I go crazy. Not. <laughs> it gets really wide very easily. So everything has to be tamed down on this beast. Really is a challenge to uh, bring it into control. But I think that maybe that's a, enough to give you some ideas about working on this instrument. We all want to play it. It's a, it's a great horn, uh, but it has its challenges. I, I want to just play a couple of little excerpts. Uh, this is in a tune called Zagranitsa on one of our recent albums. Um, I'm actually playing bassoon on the head, so you'll hear a little touch of bassoon before the soprano. I switch over to soprano for the solo, but let me let you hear this. play one more, one more thing off this it's a nice soprano this is just the head on this but uh, such a sweet sound uh, uh, on this head I think uh, we'll end with this this is a tune called Snowdrift this is our uh, jazz group called Cute Up
that's why I want to play soprano. <laughs> what a great sound. But it's a lot of work. You cannot just sit back and expect it to come to you. You have to really work at it. By the way, uh, I do play the Rousseau 3, NC3, for my classical playing. I'm playing the Jody Jazz DV. This is a six star. Uh, and that's what you're hearing on the recordings as well. Uh, <clears throat> love those mouthpieces. Playing the Cannonball Soprano. This is the one they call the arc. It has a curved end, a little arc on the end. And it has both necks straight or curved. I find the straight a little more in tune, so I use the straight, even though I'd rather use the curved. But uh, just a little bit about gear, in case you were interested. Uh, wish you all the best. I hope you'll have a great experience with the soprano saxophone. And check out the other videos uh, for the saxophone. There are some saxophone videos in the jazz playlist, and there are many, a ton of saxophone videos in the saxophone pedagogy playlist. So check those out. You might want to also check out the, some of the auxiliary videos. I hope you'll, you'll look into it and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.